Good evening and welcome to the Asia Society. My name is Vishaka Desai and I have the honor of being president of this wonderful institution. It's my great honor and pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of not only the Asia Society, but also our partner, Center for the Advanced Study of India, or CASI as we all know it, at the University of Pennsylvania. I want to thank Devish Kapoor, the director of CASI, and all of the staff members at CASI for their help in making this event possible. CASI is a fine institution, and it's not surprising that there are a number of benefactors, advisors of CASI who are also members of the Asia Society, including our own chair, Chip K, who is not only a great friend of India, supporter of the Asia Society, but also an integral member of CASI's International Advisory Board. So I welcome you on behalf of all of us, but especially on behalf of Chip K, who couldn't be with us, unfortunately, this evening. And indeed, it was Chip himself who really made the matchmaking possible. So we're really thrilled about this. Let me also mention that this event is part of the Nand and Jeet Kemka Distinguished Lecture Series at CASI, which is an endowed public program of the Center for the Advanced Study of India, which was launched in 2007-2008 academic year and made possible through the generous support of the Nand and Jeet Kemka Foundation. The series brings renowned India specialists to the Penn community, and now I can say also to the New York community, thanks to Cassie's very nice idea of bringing our distinguished speaker for this evening uh, to us here in New York. Indeed, uh, as I was talking with our distinguished guest, Honorable Jasmin Singh Ji, he actually is a longtime friend of the Asia Society. And in fact, he was just reminding me that the first time he did something for us and with us was in 1981. So that is indeed a long time of relationship, if you will. And indeed, he was here to speak to our audience in 2005, and we are really honored and delighted to welcome you back here again at the Asia Society. As you're well aware, tonight's topic of discussion, the partition of India, or the subcontinent, one might say, is among the most momentous events in the history of the subcontinent. It is a topic that has and will always generate vigorous debates and evoke passionate reactions from all sides to the discussion. And indeed, the book that our honored guest has written has generated the same level of discussion as one would expect uh, from all topics that relate to this very important seminal event in the life of the subcontinent. In the years ahead, historians, policymakers, politicians, and South Asia watchers around the world will continue to delve deeply into the reasons behind the partition, establish culpability, and re-examine the inevitability of the partition or question whether it was inevitable or not. Tonight, we turn to the Honorable Sri Jasmine Singh, who holds one of the most respected names in India's public life and in the world of diplomacy. His Excellency will share his analysis and understanding of the events that led to the partition, where it has led the region to and the future of South Asia in the years ahead. You already have the speaker's profile as you enter the auditorium, so I won't go through his entire uh, bio only because we want to hear from him rather than from me. So I hope that you will pay attention to that. But let me just quickly say that he has really been a distinguished member of the Indian political system by being a member of the parliament, Lok Sabha. He has served with rare distinction in both houses of India's parliament and has headed six core ministries of the government of India and was simultaneously the Ministry of External Affairs and Defense during the rule of Bharatiya Janata Party uh, in, in position. He's also served as a Minister of Finance and He's also a senior fellow at Harvard University and a visiting professor at Oxford and Warwick universities. At the conclusion of Mr. Singh's remarks, 
Stephen Wilkinson, the Nilakani Professor of India and South Asian Studies and Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at Yale University, will join him to have a conversation along with Mr. Devish Kapoor, who will moderate the discussion with all of you. Uh, Professor Wilkinson has also written widely on communal violence, and his book, Votes and Violence, Electoral Competition and Communal Riots in India, was the co-winner of the American Political Science Association's Top Book Award in 2005. And with them will be Professor Devish Kapoor, who is the director of the Center of, for the Advanced Study of India, or CASI. And Professor Kapoor holds the Madan Lal Sopti Professorship for the Study of Contemporary India at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, before I turn the microphone over to um, Sri uh, Jaswan Singh, let me just tell you about two quick things because I must tell you a little bit about the Asian Society, and one of which is that if you're not members, join us. If you are members, we're happy. Thank you. The truth is that your commitment does mean a great deal to us, especially in these times when every single penny counts. Those of you who are not members yet, do join. And as a special promotion today, we are offering $10 off new memberships that just started. So just present your ticket stub at the front desk, and we'll take $10 from your membership, which is up $65 or more. And the other thing I should just tell you is that this is a kind of a crazy announcement. But let me just say that we've just been nominated as one of the organizations that actually can get uh, $200,000 from American Express uh, because they have a very special thing called TakePart.com Members Program Contest. And if you go to our website and you'll be able to figure out how to do this, we need, it just needs everybody to click in. So click. It will mean a lot to us. And tell your friends. So thank you. And the vote can be uh, done once a week through May 24th. So all of that counts. The most important thing is please do turn off your cell phone and so that we can really proceed with the program. Let me also just say that we welcome all the people around the world who are listening to this program via live webcast, and all of you online can also send questions by emailing them to moderator at asiasociety.org. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Honorable Shri Jaswan Singh. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my presence here is owed firstly, of course, to Asia Society, but also principally to Kathy and to Devesh Kapoor, without whose uh, encouragement and invitation, I, I would not be here today. Uh, I'm very grateful to Asia Society to remember my old association with them. Uh, it makes me feel uh, an antique item. <laughs> but uh, thank you. It's a fascinating subject. It's drawn uh, more attention than I thought it would draw when I wrote the book. And it has had consequences which, uh, for me personally, um, have been uh, unexpected, uh, to say the least. I asked uh, Saka, what should I say when, I, uh, when I'm with uh, your guests? And she said the thing to do would be to touch briefly on why did you write this book? Why did I write this work? I, it was my, I was searching for the causes that led to the partition of what was earlier the Indian subcontinent, as now called 
the sensation is subconscious. The partition of India in 1947 was the most traumatic event of the 20th century. It continues to live in the psyches and the memories and in the hearts of the people, both of India, Pakistan, and indeed also Bangladesh. Uh, let us uh, be very clear, ladies and gentlemen, that the provinces of India that did get divided were essentially only the province of Punjab and the province, then called province, of Bengal. These two provinces got divided, but the consequences were subcontinental. I have uh, often used uh, Gandhi's phrase. Gandhi continued to call the partition of India the vivisection of India. It is a phrase that is not much liked. The reality remains that whether it is Pakistan or India, that was the original partition, and then Pakistan separated further, and Bangladesh came into being. Pakistan and India are born of the same womb, but it was not a natural birth. It was, an, it was what is called a caesarean section. And it is another myth that we suffer from, is that it's a, it was a peaceful transfer of power, it was not a peaceful transfer of power. It involved, at, nobody knows exactly how many, but at least 13 to 15 million human beings uh, lost their lives, and many multiple human beings lost their homes. So it would be wrong to say that it would be, it was a peaceful transfer of power, and it has left its scars and traumas on uh, all over the country, not just Punjab and Bengal, particularly the indo gangetic plains, those families were divided, and those memories continue to traumatize the people. It is also a myth to say that the British, and an act of great altruism, an act of statesmanship, uh, left the country and gave it its freedom. They did not. By the end of the Second World War, Great Britain was a tired country. It had been exhausted. It had lost a lot of manpower. Its financial resources were gone. It wanted out. It wanted to leave India. And there is in this book a report, a letter that I have cited which Field Marshal Wavell wrote to his, uh, his Majesty the King then, saying that the British had ruled India on the strength of moral authority. We no longer have the moral authority, and we will not be able to rule this country. And therefore, it is better if before chaos overtakes us, we abandon the country. In fact, he had worked out a plan of... Uh, Phase dependent, phase, I can not call it anything. That's how partition came. Another very tragic aspect of it is the actual drawing on lines as to where should the partition actually be. I, it's, it's, at times, I do not know whether I should laugh at it or weep at it. Redcliffe, who drew the lines, had never been to India. He was a very eminent uh, British barrister. He had no knowledge of India. He comes in the month of July, and he has 47 days, if I'm not mistaken, or 43 days, in which to cut up this past subcontinent. He has no knowledge of the sociology, the languages, or the peculiarities of the land. There's yet another aspect of his uh, never, the day he reached Delhi, it was July, monsoon, he had never ever earlier come to India. He was afflicted by an attack of dysentery. And he couldn't leave Delhi for the entire period that he was there. 
The partition of India, therefore, was drawn on maps that were given to him. I cite this also, and also about the partition of Bengal. Why did I write about it? I, uh, I, was, I was asking, because I was discussing this with uh, Professor Ellen Wilkinson. There is an Arab historian I cite at the beginning of this book, which is Ibn Khaldun. Uh, Ibn Khaldun was a great historian. And Ibn Khaldun speaks of how anybody endeavoring to work on an historical account ought to approach his responsibilities. I commend that passage uh, because I personally feel that there is much greater relevance to us in uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh than does even Herodotus. I read that. And it's, it's, uh, Ibn Khaldun's uh, approach is to keep examining facts until you are able to establish them in a context. I wrote this work not as a historian, but as uh, somebody who was a participant in the political uh, endeavors of the subcontinent. Uh, why did partition take place? I'm not part of, we were not part of British India. I am from that part of India, which somewhat pejoratively is called native India, is now called Indian India and is now the great draw for tourists who come to India, because that's the part that they like to come to. We had no sense of Hindu and Muslim animosity at all. I continue, my home continues to be on the borders of Sindh. My relatives continue to live in Sindh, which is in Pakistan. Therefore, it is bewildering to us as to why did partition take place. Who are these people sitting in Delhi deciding that the country needs to be cut up? The country was cut up. Pakistan came into being. The idea was that with the arrival of Pakistan, the division of the country, Hindu-Muslim question would be resolved and there would be peace in the land. In the Mesopotamian campaign, writing of, uh, about uh, Field Marshal Ellenby. Mm -hmm. his, his staff officer was, uh, who subsequently became the penultimate viceroy of India, Field Marshal Wavell, writes that in Paris, it's 1920s. In Paris, they are holding a conference to, to decide upon the end of war. They'll be working, this will result in a peace that will be the end of peace. Most sadly and regrettably, what the partition of India did was to create a situation in which the Hindu-Muslim question has not been settled. Peace has abandoned not just the subcontinent, peace has abandoned India, it has abandoned Pakistan, it has abandoned Bangladesh. Jinnah has been forgotten. That's the reality. In Pakistan, he's not remembered as what he was. He's remembered in a hagiographical sense. In India, he's not remembered except in a demonized sense. I couldn't understand this. And so we, I searched, and I found it interesting that a man who had been dubbed as the ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity by Gopal Krishna Gokhale, one of the tallest leaders of the freedom movement. And Sarojini Naidu quotes this. If he had been dubbed, if Gokhale had called in 1916, Jinnah as the ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity, how was it that he became by 1930, in just 14, 15 years time, uh, virtually the Kaider Azam of Pakistan. This book in reality is an account of just 40 years, 1906 to 1946 or 47. Uh, it's, the book at its core is an account of a great tragedy. 
because I cannot see the partition of India as anything else but a tragedy. And the events that have followed are tragic in the extreme. Why therefore the book? Perhaps if we reflect on what brought the partition about, we will be better enabled to address the challenges of today and so that arrange and, and so as to better arrange a peaceful living together of the nations, of the countries that have come into being post-1947 in the Indian or the South Asian subcontinent. This was the journey, that was the writing of the book. You can do it in two fashions. As historians are given to doing, I'm not a historian, if the historian would stand here in 2010, look back to 1906, and trace the journey. I've tried. I don't know if I've succeeded. I've tried to go back to 1906 and travel with the participants of those great events and to try and live with the passions and the persuasions and the great demands of those times. Have I succeeded? I don't know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my, I, a part of the success of the work on Jinnah is the fact that so many of you have done the great courtesy of being here this evening. Uh, I must express my great gratitude to all of you. Your presence here is a vote of confidence about the book. And I'm very grateful to Asia Society and to Kasi and to Yale, uh, whose, whose presence here affirms that vote of confidence. There's a third way you can affirm that vote of confidence. Please buy copies of this book. <laughs> <laughs> Authors make very little money, and uh, it would help the cause if you did. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you want to go there? I might go there. In the witness box. Here? So we we'll now sort of begin a conversation. <laughs> Uh, 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 Professor Steve Wilkinson will sort of uh, 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 so launch us off, and uh, uh, perhaps you know his his takes sort of on the book, and perhaps he might ask Mr. Jaswant Singh a few like, questions, and then we'll sort of open it up like to the general uh, sort of audience. Steve, okay, thanks. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, to meet and listen to uh, Mr. Singh. I. I think this book is an important book for uh, three reasons. It's a book I like, it's a book I've uh, read in great detail over the past week, and uh, it's important for three reasons. I think the, the primary reason I, li I like it is that it benefits from uh, Mr. Singh's own long political experience, that people in politics see things differently than historians or professional political scientists they have more of a sense of how politicians themselves are thinking during the events that they, uh, that they describe. Uh, when Jinnah's out on his luck in the very end of um, the 19-teens, uh, those last few years after 1916, uh, Mr. Singh has a very clear idea of exactly what that means, wh exactly what his options are, why he feels badly about his initiatives at the All India uh, level. Uh, in 1937, when he's describing the aftermath of the key uh, 1937 provincial elections, um, Mr. Singh has a very keen sense of exactly what the incentives are for the provincial politicians to cut a deal with Jinnah in the aftermath of their failures in many of the provinces in the 1937 elections, the, the Muslim politicians' uh, failures. So lots of different points through the book. You have a sense... Um, that you can only get from somebody who really thinks hard about all the cross-cutting pressures that politicians face and the different um, incentives that different parties have. Uh, so that's, that's one big thing. This method, I think, is sometimes a little dangerous 
Um, so that we often don't have direct words from uh, Jinnah to say what he was thinking in any particular environment. And so um, the author has to infer what Jinnah is probably thinking from his actions and from his own assessment of the strategic situation. And um, it's, it's possible to criticize that, but I think uh, the benefit of the method is that you get this politician's eye and this sense of the strategic situation, and you get insights that you wouldn't get if you just relied on the, uh, the pure textual analysis that many historians um, do. The, the second um, reason I think this is an important book is that um, Jinnah has been the baddie in um, much of the partition literature. Um, he's been either a, a sincere baddie in the sense that uh, for 15, 20 years, his goal was the breaking up of India in the sort of more traditional narrative. Or in the revisionist uh, narrative, he's been the baddie because he engaged in a high-stakes game of uh, poker from 1937 to 1946, in which he demanded more than he actually wanted in order to get uh, leverage for his... Um, for his um, party and his interest within India, and then Congress calls his bluff. But for either reason, he's been the villain. And um, you know, Mr. Singh perhaps is someone we might expect from someone who's been in uh, opposition to Congress for a very long period, um, doesn't let Congress off lightly from the story, and tries to rebalance the story um, in looking at Congress's own culpability in the... Um, in the events that led to partition. So in 1937, for instance, one thing I very much liked about your analysis of that is um, the, the, the story you often get is that Congress's claim after the election results in the United Provinces in 1937 that we can't possibly allow the Muslim League to have a, um, a monopoly of Muslim representation in the coalition of six ministers that we're going to create in UP, where Congress had won an overwhelming victory. Um, the, the traditional narrative is, is that this is a sort of stance for secularism. And one thing that you point out, though, is that the Congress, in fact, didn't compete in the Muslim seats in Bengal. The, the Congress had relied heavily on Muslim organizations um, as a means of dealing with uh, the Muslim community prior to that. And so this claim that, no, no, we can't possibly um, not have Muslims within the Congress um, is, is, uh, is weakened by some of the events that you point out in that period. Um, you also have some very nice anecdotes about Nehru's press conference in 46 in July, which is something that leads Jinnah and many others to um, assume that any deal that they get in, that's been agreed in the, as a result of the cabinet mission negotiations is simply not going to be lived up to. And the key importance of this accidental or not moment is something that you explore really well. Um, so that's the second reason. The third reason I think uh, that this is important, of course, and one reason why probably some of you are here today, is because of the political reaction and controversy that it has generated. Um, the, the August 2009 reception of the book, uh, Mr. Singh's expulsion from um, the BJP. Um, I, I read initially a lot of the press correspondence and looked at some of the uh, television journalism that was on you know, YouTube and elsewhere of the events in August and um, read the criticisms that, that, that you, you were supposed to have said, oh, uh, it was ne it, you know, Nehru and Patel's fault. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about Patel, that you gave Jinnah a buy on the events and blamed Nehru. And, and I think the larger point I'd like to make here is that most of the people who say these things haven't read the book. <laughs> um, because at, at lots of different points in the book, you point out um, that, that Jinnah made... Um, you know, clear errors. He was fundamentally in error in, um, in proposing the Muslims as a separate nation, you say at one point. A lot of the critics obviously went to the index, looked for the mentions of Patel, then looked at those five pages in the book that mentioned Patel without realizing that, in fact, the indexer hadn't done a terrific job. And there were many other mentions of Patel in the book, including one where you said that Patel actually didn't want um, partition to happen. So people haven't read the book. It's a long book. Right? It, it, it rewards care for reading, but a lot of people obviously haven't read it. And you have a much more nuanced and balanced picture, I think, than a lot of the criticism um, that, that has been given. Now, there, there are a few questions I have, maybe three or four questions, if I could ask those and let you respond to me 
and the audience. The, the, the one at a time. Yes, I'm just one at a time. Yeah. Um, the 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 first thing is really, um, you know, when we're apportioning responsibility to individuals as opposed to social structures or historical structures, you know, what's the weight of an individual versus the structure within which they operate? Um, the the British after 1857 uh, deliberately set up uh, India with institutions that were designed to divide and rule. In the early 1860s, you have the Secretary of State for India, Sir Charles Wood, who's writing to say, we want separate units of each religion so that they'll be prepared to fire into the others in case of need. It's very, very clear. Um, the political pressure behind separate electorates, uh, um, you know, Shimla after the reservation and separate electorates, was not so overwhelming at first that the British could have not denied it. But they chose to do this, in part because it served their imperial interests. So one question is, um, I suppose, about the relative importance. If you're focusing on Jinnah, Nehru, and Gandhi and their particular role, the large personalities, aren't these people, in a way, um, you know, operating within a structure that, to some extent, they haven't made themselves? And aren't you a little bit soft on uh, the British and their responsibility, their ultimate culpability for partitioning the events in 1947? I don't think I, I, I don't think I'm soft, but if it comes across to you in reading the book that I've been soft on, on the British, then you should read what I write about Mountbatten, or what I write about Redcliffe. Uh, before I go into this, there's one particular aspect of the 1937 elections, and the assertions by the then Congress party Mm -hmm. Also, late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, because he was leading these elections in UP essentially, mm -hmm. not Uttar Pradesh, it was United Provinces. And in the elections, one of his principal Muslim lieutenants, uh, Rafi Ahmed uh, Kedwai, mm -hmm. had lost the election. Mm -hmm. He didn't win. So Nehru then arranged via Maulana Azad and late Govind Pant that uh, the Muslim League support Rafi Ahmed Kenwai in a by-election, mm -hmm. and in that by-election, uh, um, Maulanas were called by the Congress Party to campaign for them. So much for the Congress Party's secularism. Now, as far as uh, the, the British uh, 1857, we are absolutely right. 1857 was a great trauma. The British uh, survived in India by what I would call uh, the skin of their teeth. They realized then that they must continue, they must, they realized also that if the Hindus and Muslims in India were to get together, mm -hmm. they would not be in India even for 30 hours. From 1857 until 1947, this was the great fear that continued to haunt them. And at every opportunity, there was an exacerbation, a deepening of the divide between these two in any fashion, at all the time. And uh, I, I do cite correspondence, I do cite conversation uh, to affirm this. Um, people fell into the trap. The leaders of those times fell into the trap, in the sense that this was the scenario that had been prepared by the British post 1906. Uh, I thought in 1857, Palmerston, who was the Prime Minister, writes a letter and says, "Let the Jama Masjid be raised to the ground." It is. <laughs> Let no Muslim emblem remain in India. Let them be a slug, words mm -hmm. to that effect. This didn't happen, thank God, because these are Indian inheritances. Mm -hmm. And so in the sense that Gandhi and Jinnah and Nehru were playing on a playing field that had already been defined, yes, but then they were all, whether it was Gandhi, or it was Jinnah, or it was Nehru, they were the products of British education, British thinking, 
And in a very real sense, they were products of the, uh, British sensibilities. So they did that, they fell into that trap. Mm. Um, I mean, just as a, a, a footnote to the, um, the, the army thing, after the 1857 revolt, the, um, the Indian troops in the army were reduced, of course, to a very low percentage, to, so that the ratio there was, was like 1, point, 1 to um, yeah, 2.5, I think. There was another consequence, which was even more telling. Uh, particularly in what was then East India Companies, and it didn't happen mm -hmm. in what was what we were in native India. This was the disarming of India. Mm -hmm. Throughout what was East India Company or British India Company, people were forbidden to carry any personal weapon. And uh, I, I find it astonishing that uh, from where I come in Rajasthan, uh, up till now, now, my late mother died uh, in 2000. Uh, whenever I went to say goodbye to her, uh, to go to Delhi, 2000, mm -hmm. she would say, are you carrying a weapon? <laughs> because it was normal for us. Weapon was an adornment of a male human being. The British uh, removed all this. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was one of the, it was one of the most telling consequences of 1857. Mm. Uh, it had nothing to do with the law and order situation, but, uh, but there were many other consequences mm. of British intervention. Partition was the worst of it. Um, I mean, the, the second question I have, I suppose, is about whether the, the traditional idea that Nehru and the Congress tried to negotiate or the traditional Indian idea, at least, that Nehru and the Congress tried to negotiate, tried to search for common ground, but basically uh, couldn't, given the particular um, things that, that Jinnah was asking for, might not have something to it. And, and, and let, me, let me say why I think that. Um, so, so firstly, how do people act after 1947? Like it's, it's, it's sort of this bad relationship, clearly, in the 1930s and 1940s between uh, Nehru and Jinnah in a way that you explore very, very well, right? But what's the origin of that? Well, it's hard to tell, but, but one thing about the personalities of the individuals is that we can look at them after 1947 and see. And, and I look at Jinnah after 1947, and uh, on the central issue in Pakistan, when, which is over the official language in Pakistan, uh, where the majority of the population in Bengal, in, in East Bengal and East Pakistan, I was saying, we want to have uh, Bengali as one of the national languages. And what does he do? Um, he goes to East Pakistan in March and gives three speeches very, very firmly saying, let no one be in any doubt. If anybody disagrees with his policy, you are an enemy of the state. No compromise. Uh, no, let's seek common ground. He's very uncompromised. Now, if you look at Nehru. Uh, Nehru in 1947 is opposed to linguistic states shortly after independence. He's opposed to reservations. Uh, he changes his mind on both these things as a result of pushback from politicians in the next three or four years in India. Um, if you read the other biographies of Jinnah, there seems to be a greater prickliness, a sensitivity, a lack of compromise than one finds if one reads Nehru's correspondence letters to the chief ministers. And, and, and so I suppose, um, I still think that there's a, a, a personality difference between the two of them. Uh, that if you look at other indicators of their tendency to compromise, Nehru comes out a little bit better than Jinnah. Tendency to compromise. To compromise, to seek uh, common ground, to not um, see, bear uh, permanent grudges no, against people, no, these kinds of things. I understand your inquiry. Nehru, firstly, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, is not contemporaneous with Muhammad Ali Jinnah. It was really Motilal Nehru yeah, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah who were more similar age. Jawaharlal Nehru was many decades younger than uh, Jinnah. Secondly, and Jinnah always felt it very acutely, Jawaharlal Nehru was born of uh, very rich parents. And he didn't have to earn uh, any income at any time in his life. 
when Jinnah returns from, uh, from UK as a barrister, he was impecunious. He has no practice. He walks to work. And there's a very fine line that he then uses. He, he used to have to say that I, there's a hotel is still there in Bombay. He would play pool in the evening so that he could earn extra money. He says, there is room at the top, but you have to climb to that top on your feet. There is no lift to it. Mm -hmm. he, he carves his way on the Indian political spectrum. And he spent, he's after all an Indian until the last 13 months of his life. But in, in terms of his dominance of the Muslim politics of India, he becomes the dominant Muslim leader despite Muslim opposition. In Punjab, for example, the Unionist Party and uh, Sikandar Hayat Tewana and others opposed him to start with. He had no following in UP. He had no following in Bengal. His only following was limited to Bombay. How did he then create a, a, a Muslim following on an all India scale? It is a post-1937 phenomena when he decides I must become a Muslim politician. Uh, he's lost his wife, which was a tragic event. He decides at one time to leave politics altogether, buys himself a house in fashionable Hampstead in London, mm -hmm. puts his daughter to school there, until the Muslim League calls him back. In that kind of a transition, he had no place uh, for accommodation. He was also very ill. He knew that he was ill. He knew he was going. And he had no time for controversies. Hence, the speeches that he gave in Dhaka, mm -hmm. in what was then East Pakistan. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru realized, uh, soon after he became prime minister, that his principal supports in the Congress party were gone. Gandhi was gone, Patel was gone. He had to, uh, Patel was not there when the linguistic divisions were to take place. So he had to uh, meet the contentions of India on his own. He compromised, because the compromises that he made were damaging to India, as such is my view, particularly reservations. There's another aspect which I just briefly underlined. Neither Jinnah nor Jawaharlal Nehru were really rooted in the soil of India. Gandhi was. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru did not know Hindi. There are some letters that are traceable of when he writes a letter in Hindi to his only daughter. Uh, it makes I can't call it charming reading, but it makes very sad reading. He had no understanding of the deeper impulses of India, just as Jinnah had no understanding of the deeper impulses of India. Gandhi had, because he was rooted in the soil. Uh, these all contributed uh, to a situation in which Jawaharlal Nehru compromised more, his letter, for example, to Nawab Sahib uh, Nawab Sahib Bhopal, wherein says we made many mistakes. It's a very moving letter. It's a very human letter. It's deeply moving as a human being. But it's not a letter that the first Prime Minister of independent India ought to be writing when he was the principal architect of the partition. Mm -hmm. OK, maybe I'll ask one more question. Um, yeah. Just picking up on the reservations point. So at, at several places in the book, um, maybe three or four, you, you point out uh, your real reserve and distaste for um, the compartmentalization, I think, is you know, the, the, uh, the separateness uh, that reservations, separate electorates, uh, create amongst different segments of the population. And that was certainly, I mean, that was the Congress orthodoxy in the late 1930s and 1940s was that reservation, and Nehru tried to kill reservations and, and failed um, in the immediate post-position <coughs> period. But if we're looking today, and as a politician, you must have wrestled with this lots, it, it looks like um, they're completely unstoppable. 
um, that reservations were established in the post-independence period for the SCs and STs. Uh, they've now uh, expanded to more than 50% in some areas. And now the Sutcher Committee, uh, in the aftermath of the Sutcher Committee on the Stasis of Muslims, which uh, came out a few years ago, even though the commission recommended that there not be reservations for Muslims as Muslims. The Congress party uh, ran with uh, a different recommendation in the elections and in fact recommended Muslim reservations and it now looks as if they might come. So there seems to be an enormous political impulse for reservations. Um, you know, given your, your uh, real reservations about the policy, um, do you think uh, the compartmentalization and separatism that you identify in this earlier period is going to become more and more of a problem for India, or do you think there, uh, that reservations will be a short-term fix and will eventually fade away, as some of their supporters It argue? has become a major problem. It's not that it will become. It has become a major problem because it, it has atomized society. Uh, in atomizing society, you create a standoff between assumed majorities and assumed minority. And every single fold within society then begins to identify itself as an electorally advantageous or to be exploited fold via reservations. Uh, you can overdo reservations and only for political advantage as we have done already in India, it is very damaging consequences. You now wish to introduce reservations in medical services, in college education. Uh, you overdo it only for the sake of winning a vote. You exploit a fear, create a fear, and then uh, electorally seek advantage out of that. The whole process of the partition of India starts in 1906 with the Shimla delegation that you have cited, which sought a specific reservation of seats in what was then very limited electorates and very limited elections in local municipal bodies. Yeah. From 1906 to 2010, wherein every fold of society is beginning to want a reservation, has been a very damaging uh, and a destructive line uh, which politicians have followed. Thank you. Uh, I'll sort of ask you one, one question and, and then we'll sort of open it up. Uh, in, in writing this book on Jinnah, do you better understand Pakistan and its leadership now? Pakistan and its leadership negated Jinnah. There are two uh, quotations that I have used there. One is an oft-used quotation, um, which is of the 11th of August, uh, the Constituent Assembly debate in which Jinnah says what he does about uh, you can follow your religion, you can pursue it. But more important is a press conference that he gives in 1946, I think, in the November of 1946 in Delhi. And wherein, amongst other things, he says he's asked a question and he says, no, 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 there'll be a Monroe Doctrine between India and Pakistan that will be stronger than any Monroe Doctrine that exists. We shall go to each other's hell. The tragedy was that he died before he could leave an imprint on Pakistan. He was very ill. Uh, there is an account there I give of, uh, he's in Ziarat in Balochistan. It was September of 1948. Uh, he has to be brought down at Karachi airport. Uh, he's put into an ambulance. The ambulance on the way to the governor general's house breaks down. For 40 minutes, there is nobody to receive Jinnah or to take care of him. Uh, it's tragic in the extreme that the first governor general of Pakistan met. Anyway, that uh, he dies very soon thereafter. Liaquat Ali is uh, assassinated. So the successors to Jinnah didn't last. Had they lasted, perhaps 
Pakistan would have been given a shape uh, which it merits, which it deserves, which is its fate. Mm, but it went the um, military way and it's where it is now. Mm. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I think we'll sir, open it up. Uh, could please make sure your questions are short and to the point and are not statements. Uh, sort of at the back. Yes, please. Just one thing, uh, um, so thing you mentioned, since uh, where your relatives uh, uh, live and where I came from, Sin, where partition never happened until Babri mask rights. And how did you, how did you see or, or how do you foresee the role of Sin? And especially uh, GM Sayyid in the partition, who, who, popul who, got, uh, who popularized All India Muslim League in Sin rather than Jinnah and paid a heavy price and he was jailed by successive governments mm. until his last. Well, I don't see a role uh, of sin, for sin, outside of Pakistan now. Uh, GM said is gone. What was 47? Uh, was 47 is uh, long years back. A position, Sin, Balochistan, Punjab, Sarhad, Frontier, uh, these have to find an equilibrium within, uh, within Pakistan. That in that lies an answer. Uh, Sindh cannot separate from Pakistan and find, that is my view. Mm -hmm. I have relatives who continue to live there. They didn't leave Sindh. Uh, they are uh, Pakistani citizens. I, I asked them also, and they said, no. We, we are very happy as Pakistani citizens. Though I got a letter, we, I opened, I was instrumental in reopening the railway line between Sindh and uh, this part of Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. And I got a very interesting correspondence uh, for about six months from uh, uh, Benazir's uh, uh, brother, Bhutto, who said, no, no, please stop this railway line. You are flooding Sindh with, uh, all, all of you Indians will come here and we Sindhis will be left nowhere. That's not so. Uh, Sindh has to be part of Pakistan. Yes, here. Let me indulge the question a little different. If the British had left India intact, would you think there would have been a civil war subsequent to that? Nonetheless, and if there was a civil war and it was not partitioned by civil war, do you think there would have been an Indian leadership would have emerged to have a Lincoln-style civil war and India will be like United States? India would not have been like United States. Let us not aspire to be like United States either. <laughs> India should be like India. But the question as to whether or if the British had just left, Gandhi had said, you leave us to our fate, we'll find an answer. Would there have been a civil war? I reverse the question and ask you, was the partition not a civil war? What else can be a war when between 13 to 15 million died? Uh, I, this is the first account that, uh, that an Indian member of parliament has written about Jinnah. It has caused, uh, I don't know why, it caused so much excitement. Every year in the United States of America, there are at least 20 to 30 books still being written about the Civil War. I, I, I think we need to reflect on it deeply, that uh, there was a Civil War in India. It is like the American Civil War. Because the British were there, it, we could not find the natural balance out of it. Uh, this, this, this like program is sort of on the web, and, this, and we've just like received a, a question from someone like from the web, and, and, she, and she asks, uh, in the current context, partition seems like a good thing like for India. I don't know sir, about Pakistan though. Look at the situation in Pakistan right now. 
uh, 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 Muslims are fighting an internal war against against the 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 like jihadis, and I don't know if India, being a Hindu majority like nation, that it 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 it, it could have been able to fight this war, uh, sort of against the the like jihadis without sort of offending its Muslim population. This war like would have cost India a great deal uh, uh, of social uh, sort of unrest. In many ways, Pakistan is a good buffer between India and radical and radical jihadis. It's what uh, are your thoughts? No, I will. I'll respond to it. It's a question. It's a thought that quite often gets voiced. I don't know what the latest figures are, but India has more Muslim citizens than Pakistan has. It is the third largest Muslim country in the world. Indonesia, Bangladesh, India. It's not as if uh, the Muslim, the Muslims that have continued to live in India are the ones that either chose not to go to Pakistan or couldn't go to Pakistan. The dilemma that Pakistan faces is tragic. Muhammad Ali Jinnah said Muslims are a separate nation. It's ironic and tragic that a nation created for the Muslims should now find Islam as a problem and that Muslims ought to be in conflict with the state of Pakistan. The other dilemma, which again I reflect on, soon after partition, India and Pakistan got interlocked into the division of the globe in the Cold War. Pakistan got sucked into the Western national interest circuits and India into the, uh, not so much the Soviet camp, but a non-aligned camp. This, was not, this had not been anticipated. Pakistan was assumed from then, a Baghdad Pact sent to Seattle as the bastion uh, of uh, Western interests. It is ironic that Pakistan today is the problem for the Western interests. Uh, these are some of the tragic ironies of the partition. Uh, and therefore, I don't see how anybody, NATO or Afghanistan and NATO or the United States of America or anybody, can come to us and solve our problems. India and Pakistan we will have to solve our problems uh, in response to this. How can NATO, North Atlantic, how has geography been redefined, Stephen, forgive me, since when has North Atlantic arrived to the Pamir Mountains? <laughs> and so how is North Atlantic going to solve the problems of the region? Uh, we have to find an answer and it's uh, not much good saying that because Pakistan is troubled within, therefore just as well that they are not with us. No, they are still very much part. The, the hundreds of thousands of families that are interlinked, I have every day, if I permit them, there would be about 50 people from my villages who would come to me beseeching for visas to go to Sydney. A village which is 35 miles, 35 kilometers away, for which they would have to undertake a 3,500 kilometer journey. I am unable to convince myself. Yes, yeah. Would you, would you use the mic? around the Hindu-Muslim question uh, not being addressed by the partition. And uh, just in my humble opinion, this is, you know, even today lacked a very honest debate. I mean, when do you think the moment of reckoning comes when there's a, you know, honest debate uh, or honest dis discussion wherein, you know, which kind of helps India evolve into a more vibrant democratic society? We still have, we still do not have a uniform common civil code or things of that nature. So what's kind of your view on that? I haven't followed the question. Uh, would you repeat it? Uh, I think. What is it about Hindu Muslim? That it's still not yet. You alluded to um, you know the the fact that the Hindu Muslim question was you know, not resolved by the partition, and which kind of makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, you know, though, in my humble opinion, I still think that, the, you know, this, this Hindu-Muslim question or whatever the, the, the theme is, has, you know, anyway eluded a debate, I mean, or, 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 dis, or an honest discussion. I mean, there are you know, various <coughs> political theatrics that you see, um, you know, in that connection around elections and whatnot. But, uh, you know, how do you see that, you know, question resolving itself over a period of time? I mean, you know, in an in a, in a honest... Oh, yes, I understand now what you mean. It has to be resolved by society, not by politicians. Sure, but I just want to see how, how, how do you see that evolution happening, the maturing... Through society, not through political exploitation. What you call democratic is where... Uh, because the, the first the fear is created, and then the fear is exploited uh, for uh, garnering good. It is society's... And I have such conviction about the uh, social structures of India and Pakistan and their essential uh, strength. Left to themselves, societies have both cleansing mechanisms as also systems by where, whereby they would uh, find answers. I'll give you a specific example, which I live, which my wife lives, in a part of Rajasthan called Jaisalmer, from where my mother comes, and where from my wife's family comes. The Hindus have voluntarily, over centuries, decided not to eat a wild boar. And the Muslims who inhabit it have, through centuries, decided not to eat beef. This is no law that has done. They have decided to do this of their own. In a place called Pokhran is a shrine. Pokhran became famous for the test is a shrine called, uh, for, uh, he, he was a Hindu Rajput who went out to save cows, he got killed, he's venerated and is supposed to, is, is, where he's venerated is called Ram Devra. The Muslims call him Ram Sa Peer. Mm -hmm. And come there. I went to Balochistan to the principal Shakti Peet, the first Shakti Peet, in Las Bela, at Hinglaj, it is still there. Hmm. Hinglaj is called uh, the first Shakti Peet by us. The Baloch call it Nani Ma, and go there annually uh, in a fair. It is not governments that find answer, it is societies that find answer. And now of that, I am absolutely committed. You go to Sindh, in a place called Britisha, which is, uh, or the great, so, where, anyway, don't, uh, there are many multiple examples that I can give. Sri Chaste. Uh, Jasmanji, this, this book is made doubly interesting by the fact that you're a major participant in the Indian political process. Uh, the analogy is not perfect, but it's akin to Winston Churchill writing the history of the Second World War, which, he, which as you know, he did. The question is as follows. In the course of researching this book, introspecting, reflecting, engaging in these sessions, you must have learned new things uh, about India, Pakistan, partition, and the formation of these, nation, these three nation states. If you knew then what you know now, would it have affected your behavior and actions as defense and foreign minister? Then means what? Then is before you, before you, when you assume those positions, if you knew then of what you know now, is there anything you learned that would have affected your actions, behaviors, views, any of those things? But frankly, I don't think so. Because then the discharge of my responsibilities as defense minister, or as minister of external affairs, the inherited uh, assets or values or prejudices are part of you. Of course, I learned many new facts. Uh, but did I learn anything essentially new about Hindu, Muslim certainties? No. Because I grew up in circumstances where this were imbued in me. I, I hate to do it, but I have. To. I recommend very strongly that you please buy an earlier book of mine called <laughs> it's called it's called call to honor and in that call to honor the first chapter of that book all subsequent books where i describe in detail 
uh, the challenges that, uh, that uh, uh, were faced by me, like Kargil or Kandhar or uh, attack on parliament. The attack was just 20 feet from my office in parliament. Yet, we went and invited uh, General Musharraf to Agra. Um, I give an account there of how there was, I was under great pressure. Uh, the government was under great pressure. Mm, I don't want to go into cabinet secrets, etc. But read that book. You'll find an answer to that. It'll also mean an additional sale for me. <laughs> <laughs> there, at the back. Mr. Jaswan Singh, uh, thanks again. It's an honor that uh, you're here today. I wanted to ask regarding um, the reaction, the very strong reaction that this book had from within the party and wondering what your take is on all the fireworks that ensued after the book came out, particularly given that you know another senior leader, Mr. Advani, had made some statements which didn't really have a long-term impact on his stature in the party. And all the turmoil that has happened with this being one incident, what do you see as the future of the party? Or oh, the future of the party to which I no longer belong <laughs> is, <laughs> is not a matter of indifference to me. That would be a dishonest answer. But it's certainly some distance removed from it. I'm saddened that the kind of... Uh, kind of a variety of intolerance was shown about a viewpoint. My writing about Jinnah was not a secret. I had not kept it. There's nothing secret about it. I didn't keep it as a secret. I had shared <laughs> that I was writing about Jinnah, because it took me five years on several occasions with both Mr. Adwani and the President. I had said so in public platform, public platforms. I'm certain that the party reacted in the manner in which it did, and I'm doubly certain that they reacted without actually reading the book. If they had read the book and yet then done it, uh, even then it would have been uh, virtually medieval in being in reaction that you, I'm glad they only expelled me and didn't burn me at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one could ask, uh, Mr. Singh, that after all, the party had shown in different forms signs of intolerance. So why should it be a surprise? Uh, uh, give me an example, and I respond. I mean, you know, if you take like Gujarat. Of course. So, the, I mean, so I after all, it's not that the BJP's flashes of intolerance have been uh, exceptional. No, but in, for instance, in Gujarat, yet again, the same book, Call to Honor, read it. <laughs> I, I describe in detail. Some of us opposed it. I describe in detail how traveling with Mr. Bajpayee, who was the prime minister, we took a decision that uh, the then chief minister of Gujarat must step down. Mr. Adwani did some, had a conscious view. But for holding a view like that, it was not as if uh, I was expelled by the party. I, I oppose the whole Ayodhya movement. In a formal meeting of the national executive, I told Mr. Advani, don't do it. I, I was the, possibly the only one who said, don't do it. As deputy leader of the party in the Lok Sabha, yet he did me the courtesy of calling me soon after he reached Vazabad and said, just once my lifetime's work is over. The party left it to me to defend the party in parliament, knowing that I was not a supporter. I was not a supporter of the party uh, making an alliance with the Shiva Sena, for example. I was outvoted. But because I deferred, uh, at least it didn't go to the extent uh, of, uh, uh, sort of uh, expelling. Why? Perhaps. Um, a convenient moment was being sought when to get rid of this rather awkward personality called this one thing. <laughs> Steve, did you have any follow-up? 
question? Um, no, I'll, I'll wait. Yes, there at that corner. Thank you for giving us the insight, which we never knew until we read your book, you know, about the Jinnah's, you know, personality and his... But uh, the basic uh, thing which we know from the history and the politicians, if you know, the Gandhi was the main object when he had a meeting with uh, uh, Nehru, J uh, Jinnah and uh, Patel, and the question really comes, who should be the first prime minister of this country? And Gandhi really offered first to Patel, the prime ministership, which was the first leader of the country. And uh, eventually Patel decided that he doesn't want to be the prime minister, but Jinnah and Nehru decide these two things. And this is where all the trouble, I think, started, where the Jinnah being the senior most person in the you know, freedom of uh, uh, getting the independence, he deserved to be the prime minister or the first leader, and he was never given, and that's what made him annoyed and led all to all these uh, partitions. Uh, do you think this is a... <laughs> well, it's an interesting thesis, but I don't know if it is supported, uh, corroborated by the, uh, the facts of the matter. I'm not an historian, but I have gone through accounts of how uh, Gandhi actually offered went to Mount Batten and said, you, you offer the premiership to Jinnah. And he said it twice, uh, twice or three times. And I'll go around the country and convince the country to do it. And the Congress party didn't accept. And there is also an account in my book of a meeting of the All India Congress Committee of 3rd June 1947, in which uh, resolution was moved for accepting the British proposal for partitioning the country. There was an amendment moved to this resolution by Raman Ohar Lohia. The amendment was put to vote, and the amendment defeating the resolution moved by Nehru and Patel for partitioning the country was carried by the AICC. Gandhi voted against partition. And having done that, then he said, now let us accept it, because we'll have to change the leadership and we'll have to go back all over, all the way back into this old situation. Yes, here. Yeah. In this um, auditorium a couple of years ago, I attended a, uh, a, a book lecture by a man, unfortunately, whose name escapes me, but the, his book was In the Shadow of the Great Game. And his, he was the ADC to Mountbatten at the time, and his thesis was that the real reason that Britain supported partition was that America was making foreign policy overtures to India, and in the spirit of the great game, Britain, in order to maintain a bulwark against that, then supported um, an alliance with... Uh, what was then to be Pakistan. Do you, um, presumably you've read the book, and I wondered if you... It um, wasn't as clear-cut as that. It must be a book by John Kerr that you're referring to. The great game. That is a kind of great game with different players now being played in the same region, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, what was the situation? That is in this book an account I give an appreciation by Ockenleck. He was asked to... Uh, give a military appreciation, it's a remarkable uh, appreciation, in which in 1946, I think it is, he's talking of the danger to India from the eastern uh, regions. He's talking of how it is important for uh, Great Britain to have a foothold uh, in the west of India. Uh, there are accounts there of Winston Churchill telling Mountbatten well, you agreed to partition. Leave a little bit. Keep a little bit for Great Britain. It wasn't as if United States of America supported India, but United States was pushing Winston Churchill for freedom, freedom of India, particularly after the Japanese invasion. Up till then, uh, they had rather 
left India to the care of the imperial Great Britain, not involving themselves much more than that. Yes, we have uh, just just about a few minutes left, so we'll take these, these are last two questions. Yes, over there. I wondered if you could clarify your um, background in terms of the, the hard work that you've done to create this text for us to read and say a bit more about the research uh, that went into your making of this text. In particular, the figure that you've mentioned a couple of times of 13 to 15 million deaths at partition. Uh, I wondered if you could clarify the source of that or, and if the other scholars might on the platform weigh in on that because I've never heard that figure before. Yeah, no, the, uh, I, think, I think the confusion, the, the number for deaths is the number for migrants or should be the number for migrants. And the number of deaths, um, the, you know, the hard estimates that have been done such as they are go from around 120,000 to 200,000, but we know there are many, many missing people. So there's been a study that's been done by uh, Asim uh, Khwaja Tathnian and Prasant Bardvaj, where they look at the 1951 census and they basically impute minority growth rates up to that and then work out how many missing people there are. And there, there are many millions missing by that. That doesn't mean that they actually all die, of course. So, you, so, the, so, so those figures are a little bit... Um, are, are a little bit off. I think it was... No, I, would, I, I wouldn't dispute figures. Please don't minimize the tragedy simply because the figures don't match up to what I said. It's a very vast movement, uh, 13 to 15 million human beings moving from one part to another, not knowing where they are going because the partition did not get announced. Uh, Pakistan has come into being but the territory of Pakistan has not yet been announced by Red Cliff. Uh, that sort of thing. And wouldn't you say that given the number of people who are being transferred for 13 to 15 million people, the actual numbers of deaths or the estimated numbers of deaths are actually relatively few? No. One death is relatively too many. Uh, I would not be able to accept that simply because the figure is lower than what I cite, therefore it is relatively less. Don't minimize death. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I think we are out of time, but we'll take one last question there. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you, of course, being a researcher, uh, would be valuing empirical data and as the questions. How would you describe the condition, empirically based, of Muslims in India today? In a similar fashion, as would be the condition of the Hindus in Pakistan or Bangladesh. Uh, there is a sense of alienation. There is a sense, I describe it. Um, I have said so, uh, that the uh, Hindus in Pakistan are, are looked at with suspicion. Uh, the Muslims in India feel alienated. They feel separated from... Uh, the rest of India. Uh, you have to look, and I have said so in public speeches. You have to, they can't make a legitimate demand. Because the minute a demand is made, the counter comes, oh, but you've already got Pakistan, you are still making a demand. That, sort of, that kind of separation, and it's the same so far as the Hindus in Bangladesh or Pakistan are concerned. So what has it solved? Uh, you know, I'm sure we could stay here like for much, much like longer. Uh, but I would like to th uh, to to thank Mr. Singh and, and to Steve, and of course like to Vishaka, to like for making this event possible, and 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 for y'all like for being here. Thank you. Let's thank our speakers. Thank you. And I have the. Uh, nice and a good pleasure to just say that there is a reception upstairs and a book signing since Jaswan Singh Ji has said that you must buy those books. So please go upstairs and we'll see you there. Thank you. <laughs>